Mark chapter 11, we will be looking at verses 1 through 10. We'll end with the um, Hillel Psalm there, and then um, finishing up <clears throat> this week with uh, Good Friday and then Easter. So Mark chapter 11. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And yet it seemed that the lost um, were the ones that crucified him to say goodbye. As he enters into Jerusalem uh, on a donkey. You notice that in the, in the video that one of them said a prophet and he's on a donkey. Why a donkey? You know, we're going to talk about that today. Um, and the fact that he was the king of Israel on this donkey. But they were rejoicing. They were announcing, they were proclaiming, and yet the following day they will be screaming, crucify him, crucify him. I'm amazed at the remarks of unbelievers towards Jesus Christ. It's amazing how there is so much hatred towards Jesus, especially those that don't want any religion at all in this world. And they have this hatred for God. And they make it known. They don't try to hide it. They're very clear about it. Uh, they're adamant to destroy it, if possibly, and, and rule it out of the laws, if they can, out of the schools, out of the government, anywhere possibly. There's just such a hatred towards Christ, towards God. Uh, I don't understand it. I know that for myself, I remember the attitude I had as a young man without having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, though I know my attitude towards God, and it wasn't that extreme. I knew there was a God. I knew He existed. My parents went to church, and once in a while I, I would go to church. But uh, God was there to help me when I needed help, you know, when I was in trouble, and I cried out, God, help me, and He came through somehow. And I'm like, thank you, okay, see you later for a while until I need help again. And it wasn't a relationship. It was more of a... Uh, a, a relationship of when I need you, I will call on you, and, and then you be there to help me out of it, and then I will say thank you, but now we'll go on with my life, living it the way that I want to live it. And so I understand that, but to have a hatred towards God and, and to want Him removed from society completely, that's something I don't understand. In fact, it's, uh, it's foreign to me. Today's theme is Welcome Your King. Welcome your king in two tenses. One is that you will welcome your king in peace or you will welcome your king on the judgment day. You, you will either accept him as Lord and Savior who will bring you the peace of God in your life or you will see him as he marches towards you in judgment. And we're going to take a look at both aspects of his first and second coming. Jesus enters into Jerusalem this is the beginning of the end of his earthly ministry. And then he will ascend unto heaven and sit at the right hand of the Father and then let the Gentile world receive uh, his work upon the cross. And when the Gentile age is over, the tribulation period will begin. And then the second coming will take place at the end. And then Jesus will rule and reign for eternity, bringing peace to all those Jews and Gentiles in the world. Sunday for him was a welcome into Jerusalem, but by Monday, as I said earlier, he enters a den of lions, in a sense, and a week of hell for him. I am sure that he did not look forward to what he was going to struggle through that whole Passion Week. Uh, the comments, the mocking, the ridiculing, the setting up by the religious leaders, the accusations, and so forth, the, the abandonment that he felt from his disciples leaving him, uh, being tortured and beaten and then put upon a cross, you know, and then buried. And I really believe that he probably rejoiced seeing the end more than what he had to go through. And that is the day that he resurrected from the dead. That was what it was all about. He came to seek and save the lost. He looked forward to the day that he resurrected and showed himself to the disciples and to the world. That's why he did all that. He knew that that needed to happen. And he knew that that would bring about a whole new life, a whole new world. It would bring eternal life to this world because we're in bondage to sin. We're in bondage to the enemy. Uh, we're foreigners to God himself. And he came to reunite us and to bring us to God in a right relationship with him. And so, yes, the resurrection was a joyous thing in his life. 
It was the thing that he could say, I'm making all things new. It will be over, it will be done, it will be paid for, and there will be no more worries concerning eternal life. And so he looked forward to that. In the previous verses leading up to chapter 11, Jesus talked to his disciples about what it takes to be great in the kingdom of God. And he said that he did not come to serve, I'm sorry, he did not come to be served, but to serve and to be a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to serve. And he did that. He never once was put on a pedestal. He never once was put on a throne. He came to serve. He washed the disciples' feet. He fed the multitude. He is a king that feeds. He's a king that serves. That's the type of characteristic that we as believers should have. We should be servants. We should be reflecting Jesus Christ in our walk with Jesus Christ. It is difficult because we live in a day and age where we're catered to. Everything is about us. What can I have? What can I get? What do I deserve? I deserve that, and so give it to me. And we are not used to giving to others. Jesus himself said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And he did not come to serve, but to serve and not be served. And so we need to be servants, all of us. It's not just for the pastor. Well, he's a pastor. He's a minister. The word minister means a servant. And so he's to serve us. No, we are to serve one another, the Bible says. That's the attitude that we should all have. I grew up in a very old school family. My aunts and uncles, when I was a child, I could remember sitting at the barbecues on the weekends, and usually it was every weekend, and they would cook their their chicken and their steaks and so forth, and then they get their their chili all prepared and the beans and the rice and you know and all the drinks and everything, and we all just sit together, and the guys would just sit on the bench. And they start talking about work and sports and news, whatever it was. And then all the ladies would go into the kitchen, all at once it seemed like it. They all come out with these plates and they would put them right in front of their husbands. And I used to always think, how do they know what they want to eat? How did they figure that out, you know? And it's like they knew because they did it all the time. They were servants. Back then, that's how it was. It's not like that anymore. When when I had um, taken my wife to one of these uh, barbecues, it was so foreign to her being um, Caucasian and not growing up in that atmosphere. Uh, She asked me, do they do this all the time? I go, yeah, go get me a plate. (laughs) I try to get her to get me a plate. Go get your own plate. You (laughs) You got two legs. What are you, stuck to the bench? (laughs) And so totally different attitude. Uh, compared to that time frame and that old school mentality. There's still some like that. There's still some like that. Even in this church, sometimes I'll be sitting out there and talking with people and just trying to get to know people, and someone will come up with a plate and just plop it down. And that question's still there. How did they know what I wanted? How did they know that? And it's always what I, what I want, you know? And so we're to be servants. That's the attitude that we're supposed to have. You know, it's better to err as a servant than to err as someone that wants to be served when you think about it. It's a good attitude to have. And so he talked about those type of things to his disciples. There's a purpose for that. Now, when we look at chapters 1 through 10, we see Jesus as the servant living his life in service to those around him. And then we get to chapter 11 and begin the second section of Mark's gospel where we see the servant Jesus giving his life in sacrifice as a service to his disciples and to his people and to the world. And so we call it Passion Week. Passion Week starts on Sunday, the 10th of Nisan. Jewish calendar ends on the early uh, day of Nisan 14th, which is the Passover, which is coming up this Tuesday. Now, after taking a deep breath... Through all of this is that's happening in Jesus' life, he prepares himself to enter into Jerusalem. And so we come to chapter 11, verse 1 through 3, and we see Jesus' prophetic ride into Jerusalem. Now the word prophetic, what does prophetic mean? That's a big word. Basically what it's mean, it's been foretell. Somebody in the past said that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey. They wrote this down hundreds of years earlier, and so it's a prophetic word. 
It's foretold about Jesus. And so it says in verse 1, Now, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a coat tied, on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So we see this whole stage being set up prophetically by the Lord Jesus. He's drawing near to the eastern side of Jerusalem. He walks to Bethsaida and Bethany, and he stops at the Mount of Olive. Now, the Mount of Olive is 2,600 feet in elevation, and it, it, it sits just above Jerusalem, and so it gives you this panoramic view of all of Jerusalem. You could see it all. It's, it, it is a, an amazing sight when you stand on it. If you get the chance, go into the middle classroom, and we have a picture on the south wall there uh, from the Mount of Olives looking down at Jerusalem. From there, you can see the site where Abraham was asked to offer up his son Isaac. From there, you can see the, the city of David where, where his little palace sat, and then it overlooked all of the valley. Uh, you can see where Solomon built the temple where it should have been. Today, you see the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim uh, mosque that, that sits there. Uh, you can see one of the, the little areas to the left of that as you're looking down where the possible temple will be today. And by the way, they are talking in Israel about building that temple again. And just this week, they started training priests for the temple. And so they are studying the Old Testament laws and Leviticus and so forth and how to cleanse themselves, how to approach the sacrifices and the offerings and who does uh, the certain task at certain times because it will be uh, pretty much running 24 hours a day in the different shifts of, of maintaining the temple. And they're equipping them to do that today. That's amazing. And you can see all of this from the Mount of Olive. You can see the Golden Gates which are walled up at this time. If you look at the picture, you will see down to the right of, of the mosque, uh, two gates, but they're all walled up, and in front of that is a cemetery. Those are the two gates that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Those are also the two gates at his second coming that he will ride in on a horse. Now they put a cemetery in front of there, because they're enemies of Christ. And they know that for a Jew to touch a dead body would mean that they become unclean and it would be unlawful. They would break the law. And so they thought, let's put a cemetery there and we'll keep Jesus out. Because being a Jew, he can't go through there because of these dead bodies. Except they forgot one thing, that when he comes back, he's going to resurrect everybody. So they won't be dead, they'll be alive. And then he'll enter into those golden gates as the Messiah, as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so Jesus sends two unknown disciples into the village to obtain this animal so that he can ride into Jerusalem. Now it doesn't say which two disciples. It just says two disciples. The gospel doesn't tell us. Some have suggested it was Peter. Some said it was John. I mean, we don't know. It's just suggestions, hearsay. It doesn't say who he sent. Does it matter? Why the secrecy? Why not just say who it was that went down? Well, it really doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is what we do know. And what we do know is important and that we react to those things that we do know. It's the things that we don't know that we seem to react to and rationalize why we don't want to react to the things that we do know because we don't know those things. And, it, and it's so funny how we are because we don't know it. We struggle with things. There are things that we just don't know. We just don't know, and we won't know. Uh, scientists, you know, it, it cracks me up how they will say, millions of years ago this took place. And my question is, were you there? How do you know that took place millions of years ago? Well, no, no, we're, we're guessing. Do you know someone that was there? You're guessing? Really, that's all it is, is a guess. They're guessing it's a theory. They don't know. There are things that we don't know. There are things in the scriptures that I don't know. And I have read through the Bible a lot of times. And there are things that I don't always understand. The sovereignty of God. Uh, the definition of sovereignty is that God's will will be done. He's God. 
And if he wants something done, he's going to get it done, whether we like it or not, because he's God. He created everything, and he has that power. If, if, if God wanted to, he could just wipe us all out just, just by thinking it, and it's done. But he doesn't do so because it's not his will. He's sovereign. He loves us. So his sovereignty, his will will take place. He has a plan. It will take place, you know, and yet he gives us free will, doesn't he? We all have free will, and we can exercise that free will, can't we? Sure we can. I want to walk this way, so I walk this way. No, I don't, want to, I don't want to go back here. We can all do that. You know what? I want to just stop teaching right now, and I'm just going to walk away. And go. Wouldn't you be surprised? But I can do that. I can do that. It's free will. How do you reconcile those two, sovereignty and free will? Because they work together somehow. I don't know how. You know, why do some respond to the gospel and what Jesus did on the cross, and others don't? They exercise their free will and they're exercising it outside of working together with the sovereignty of God. That's something I don't understand because there are things that I want to do, but is it what God wants to do? And am I getting in the way if I do them? And so, so I struggle like, Lord, I don't want to do that, but if you want me to do it, I want to do it. And so I struggle with that. So one of the first questions that I'm going to ask Jesus when I get to heaven, okay, I want to know right now, how does that work? How does that work? You know, and it's almost natural that you don't even realize it. You know, how, how does a flower from a seed all of a sudden sprout up and boom? You know, you, you, you plant it one day and you forget about it and then you come out like, man, how did that just pop up? It seemed like I just planted it the other day. How does that all work? You know, and it's, it just blows you away. It's naturally, you know. So I walk this way. Guess what? God knew I would. And so he planned it. But how? <laughs> you know, I don't know. There are things that we just don't know. It's not that God's keeping them a secret. He told Daniel to, to seal up these things. It's not the time for you to know. It will happen in the end, and they will understand those things, so don't worry about that. What we need to worry about are the things we do know, right? We know God loves us. He sent his son to die on the cross for us. We know God has a plan for our lives. Jeremiah um, twenty nine eleven, tell us that. He has a purpose. He has a hope for us. We know these things. And so we need to react upon those things that we do know. What are you doing with that? What are you doing with the things that you do know? These two unknown disciples, they, they just did it. They didn't understand what was going on completely. They were commanded to go down. Jesus has set this up. And so they just went. We don't need to know who they were. They went. And so they went and they saw the coat there that had never been ridden. And they, they decided to take it. You know, as Jesus commanded them. Now, it's interesting, this little animal, it's probably about a year old, never been ridden. And usually animals that were set aside, or we use the word consecration, or set apart for God, sanctification, these animals were usually young babies. And so this colt, never been ridden, is probably about a year old, and it was prepared for Christ to ride on into Jerusalem. It's untamed, and Jesus says, go get it. And if anyone stops you and they ask you, what are you doing? You just say, the Lord has need of it. That's all you need to know. The Lord has need of it. And immediately, they'll send it to you. Now, how did he set that up? I read some commentaries, and they said Jesus ran down there and spoke with a bunch of guys and set it all up and said, look, I'm going to send my disciples down there. And you kind of scare them and say, what are you doing? And, you know, and then they're going to say this, and then you say, okay, go ahead. And then they'll go, wow, he must be the Messiah. That's amazing how they read into the text. It doesn't say that. You know, it doesn't say that at all. Jesus just said, go down. And they went down and they asked for the donkey or the colt and they received it and they went back. Now, I think personally, just my opinion, I think that it was God working his sovereign will with our will. He wanted to teach the disciples a lot of lessons, trust and faith obedience. Just go get it. But what are we getting? And what for? And why? We, we always have those questions, don't we? I have need of it. Just go. And so we go. Yeah, but there's opposition. Don't worry. When they ask you, you just tell them the Lord has need of it. For what purpose? For what purpose? The Lord has need of you. The Lord has need of you. He created you with a purpose. He needs us all together. I, I was thinking about this today. Uh, <clears throat> some of you that are new here, uh, this has been planned and prepared for you. 
those of you that have been coming here for years, tens of years, some of you, you have been preparing all of this for us. This whole service, the way the church functions and works, it's all a preparation of God to prepare people to receive the gospel message, the message of Jesus Christ. The whole purpose of having parking lots and buildings and attendants to park you and, and ushers and greeters to get you in here, you know, to sit down in the air conditioners in the children's ministry so you have no distractions and, and to sit here and so forth. This, all of this has been taking place all morning long to get you here to sit down and to hear the gospel. Because that's what's important is to hear the message from God. What does God have for me today? I see some of those posts sometimes on Facebook. It's Sunday. I'm always excited about Sunday because I'm ready to hear from God. What is God going to tell me today? And people approach it that way. We have to see it that way. All of this is done so you could sit and hear his word being spoken. And it is his word that will penetrate your hearts and accomplish what he wants it to accomplish. It's not even my words. I'm, I'm blown away by that. I, I will step down from here and someone will come up to me and say, wow, you really ministered to me when you were speaking about this situation about our marriage. And I'm thinking, I didn't even touch on marriage. What are you talking about? And it just fit perfectly in their life because it's the Holy Spirit ministering to them. You know, I, I think I mentioned something about unconditional love. We have conditions on our love for one another. We do. And then a person came up afterwards, and that was really great, that sometimes I, I put these conditions on my husband, and, and I'm thinking that he should be doing my ministry when really he should be doing his own ministry. And I'm thinking, wow, you got all that from me saying that? <laughs> I'm like, wow, because it wasn't me. It was God preparing everything so that you could sit and hear the Spirit of God speaking to you personally. He has a purpose for you. Every one of us have a purpose. He has need of you. That's beautiful, that God would need me. I used to roam this earth without God, wondering, why am I here? Is this what life's about? Fighting with my wife? Leaving my kids on a Friday night to go get drunk? And then have a hangover all day on Saturday morning so that I can do it Saturday night again and start all over on Sunday? Is that what life's all about? It just used to confuse me. And then when I met Christ, I realized, no, it was way more than that. God had a purpose for my life, my wife's life, my children's life. That was my son giving announcements. He's now assistant pastor here at the church. And it's taken 30 years for him to get here. 30 years, that's God's plan and purpose for his life and now his wife's life and hopefully their children's life. And it just continues to grow and expand as we continue to serve the Lord uh, one with another. That's how God works. He gives us purpose, and that's a great purpose. He has need of you just as he needed this animal. Jesus is numbering every step of the disciples, every step, just as he's numbering your steps. He has allowed you to go through the things you've gone through for a reason, so that you can comfort others, so that you can minister, so that you can have understanding as you pray with them. And so this was his plan. And now we find in verses 4 through 6, the disciples go down and they find the colt. So they went their way, found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing, loosening the coat? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. So just like Jesus said, it happens. You know, Jesus keeps his word. Uh, when he tells you something, it's the truth. It's fact. You can take it to the bank, deposit it, and it's in your account, you know, because God said it. Uh, he's not turning back from it he's not lying to us he has said it and if he said that he's come to bring us peace then he's come to bring us peace and we need to find that peace uh, whatever promises he has given you he promised those things to you so you can claim those promises you can put them in the bank and you can depend that it's going to happen one day it might not happen today or tomorrow or next week it may happen 10 years from now but it will happen as jesus promised us and so they put jesus on this cult verse 7 through 
Eight, then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it. So these are the disciples throwing their clothes on the, on the mule there, the little colt. And he sat on it, that is, Jesus sat on it. And they spread their clothes on the road. And others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And this is where we get the word Palm Sunday. They, they climbed up the trees. They cut down the palm branches. They threw them before the, the little colt. And Jesus on the colt would walk over them as he entered into Jerusalem. And so, many joined them in this great celebration, laying their clothes, their palm branches, there before the road, giving of their material things, giving of their life, giving of their time and their efforts, and they're proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. I think this is news to some of them. Others probably got it, and they knew that he was the Messiah, and that he was fulfilling prophecy, scriptures, by entering into Jerusalem on a colt. Others were just caught up, I believe, in the crowd and what people were doing. You know, why are they throwing branches? Well, the Messiah's coming. Really? And they took their coat off and they dropped it down. You know, he must be important. Let's put our clothes down there. The king is coming in. You know, and so let's welcome him in. This was a fulfillment of Zacharias chapter 9, verse 9. If you want to turn there, you can. I'm going to talk a little bit about Zacharias at this moment. And I'm going to talk about a subject of his second coming. This was his first coming into Jerusalem there. But he's entering in Jerusalem in peace. But there's a second coming that will take place where Jesus will enter into Jerusalem upon a white horse. But he will not be coming in peace. He will be coming in judgment. I don't mean to offend you if you feel that you're offended by this message that I'm about ready to speak about judgment, about wrath, about God wiping out millions of people on the face of the earth who have not put their faith and trust in him. I apologize if that offends you, but it's the truth. It's what the Bible speaks will happen. And God has given us a way out. And it's simply to accept his peace now and not accept his wrath later. It's just really that simple. And it's our free will to choose one or the other. In Zacharias 9.9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Zion is speaking of Israel there in Jerusalem. He says, Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. This has been written hundreds of years earlier, pertaining to the Messiah coming into Jerusalem, and they should behold the king who's coming to you. He is just in having salvation. Jesus was sinless. There was no sin found in him because he was sinless. And he had salvation in his hand. And it was open to all that would receive it. And it says, lowly riding on a donkey, a coat, the foal of a donkey. Exactly what Jesus did on this day riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, they're in Roman territory. The Romans were well known for their victory parades. Uh, Romans were well known for conquering the world. Uh, They would go into other tribes and nations and cities and they would conquer them. They would just utterly wipe them off and take slaves and everything that they owned. Uh, They were well known for their celebrations as they returned to Rome. They would be in their chariots of gold and all kinds of trinkets, their armors, their chests puffed out in in their armors and so forth, their spears, their their men walking along with their helmets on. And and then they would have their captives who were all beaten up and bruised and they'd be in shackles and chains and they'd be dragging them and showing the world, we are the Romans we are victorious. They all be on their horses in strength and in power. And basically what they were saying was that we're invincible. We're invincible and you cannot come up against us. And so for the Roman soldiers there in Jerusalem under Pontius Pilate, they're watching all this and they're watching Jesus coming in on a donkey. And they're crying out, the king is here, the king is here. And he's on a donkey. And so for them, they're thinking, wait a minute, what kind of king is this? He's on a donkey. Can you imagine a grown-up on a little donkey bouncing around? You see cartoon articles like that, you know? Big old guy, he's huge, and you can barely see the little feet on a donkey, and he's riding in like this. It's so funny that they will even use that scene in movies. I remember seeing a movie, I don't remember what it was, but they were thinking, how are we going to get there? You know, a couple of guys are on horses, and all of a sudden you see this guy, and he's on a donkey, following along with him. It's hilarious when you think about it. 
a grown man on a donkey, and usually donkeys don't stride like horses, you know, they're like, and you're bouncing up and down on this little donkey. And here's Jesus on a donkey. And the Romans are going, <laughs> that's their king. <laughs> like to see him come up against, you know, the Roman government, you know. Like to see him fight one of our soldiers. Whew. I don't know what they're saying, right? And Jesus said a word, could just, whew, and they'd be gone. They don't know who he is. But that's how they approached him. Uh, Jesus warranted a triumphal entry. He surely did. But he did not come to conquer the world. He came to conquer sin. And he came to conquer sin through peace on a donkey. The donkey represents peace, humility. And that's what Jesus was portraying at this moment. So Jesus came into Jerusalem as prophesied in the way in which no one could have any excuse but to know that he was the Messiah visiting Jerusalem. You could not deny it. If you lived at that time and you saw Jesus coming in on a donkey, you go, that is so strange. And people saying, but that's what Zacharias said would happen. That is a fulfillment of scripture because that just doesn't happen. And they knew it. And we should know that today. God wants us to know that Jesus is the Messiah, and that he came to fulfill scripture. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament was very clear on when this would happen. He prophesied uh, these things that angels told him about. He said that it would happen 173,000 days, actually 173,880 days after the commandment to rebuild uh, the New Jerusalem, the temple there that was destroyed. That was 77s were to be determined upon the nations and the holy city. But the commandment to restore and rebuild the city to the Messiah would be seven sevens and 62 sevens, which comes out to that 173,880 days. Well, guess what? On March 14th, from that day that Artaxerxes commanded Nehemiah to go ahead and rebuild, 173,880 days later, which was March 14th, 445 B.C. to rebuild the temple became April 6, 32 A.D., where Jesus came riding into Jerusalem into the temple, just as Daniel said. So that's one prophecy being fulfilled concerning Jesus. Not only did Daniel say that, Zechariah say that, but the psalmist said that they would be singing the Hallel song that was sung every Passover. And they would shout out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were shouting that out on that day that Jesus rode in on a donkey. So riding a donkey in accordance with prophecy was proclaiming him as the one sent from God, the son of David, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who would die for our sins. And shortly after, less than a week, he would be on the cross for our sins. The book of Zacharias is an interesting book. I encourage you to read it. It's in the Old Testament. It's not very long, 14 or so chapters. But it is a prophetic book. It's filled with prophecies of Jesus Christ. You know, there are over 300 prophecies pertaining to Jesus' coming, all of them completely fulfilled. That is amazing. The odds of that happening is impossible. You would win the lottery. All of us would win the lottery. All of us would win the lottery before 300 prophecies would be fulfilled. And yet, <laughs> the odds of us winning the lottery, you know, is, is worse than us getting hit by lightning, from what I understand. And yet, Jesus fulfilled them all, every single one. And so this book is filled with these prophetic aspects. Uh, it's filled with the first coming of Jesus Christ, and it starts with chapter 9 to chapter 11, and speaks about Jesus coming that first time. And we see that in Mark chapter 11. And in chapter 12 through 14, we see the true triumphal entry, and it's speaking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, when he will ride upon into Jerusalem on that white horse. Now, Zechariah chapter 12 talks about Jerusalem ten times, mentions the phrase, in that day. Isaiah does the same thing, in that day. And what he's saying is, in that day in the future, that is the tribulation period, and then he begins to list the things that will happen in that day. All the nations in the great tribulation period will rise up and they will want to attack Jerusalem and destroy it. That's something that we see happening today. 
Israel is being attacked by Iran. They're literally preparing to destroy Israel. And they're getting their resources and nuclear weapons from Russia. Russia wants to see Israel destroyed also. We're living in end times. Why? Because of the resources in Israel. They are like the fourth largest fruit producers in the world. Imagine having that as a nation. They have the most minerals in the Dead Sea. It's filled with wealth. There are so much minerals there to supply arms for any nation for thousands of years. That's how many minerals are there. And so it's a very wealthy piece of land. It's kind of like the, the land that's over here in Nevada that they're fighting for right now. The Bundy's family with the ranch. I don't know if you've heard about that. The federal government came in and said, intimate domain, we're taking your land from you. And they're going, what? What for? And they wouldn't say. Well, you can't do that. Yes, we can. No, because imminent domain says that we're taking your land because we want to build something that will benefit the public in our community. That's what intimate domain's about. So they'll take your land if you're close to a freeway, and they're trying to expand the freeway so that it's best for the whole community. But this was not about intimate domain. There was something else. And so here comes the federal government start taking their cattle, taking their stuff, just, just like that. They're stealing, basically. And the ranchers rise up and other people join them and now they got militia, they got guns, they're all over the place. And now they're like the McCoys and the whatever that other group, you know, and they're standing off. I mean, they're literally, you see the videos and, and pictures and they got their guns and they're all standing off. You drop yours, no, you drop yours. And, and so for their police are tasering women that are 50, 60 years old, throwing them to the ground. I mean, this is just a, a tense situation. Then it turns out, that the federal government wants to sell that piece of land to a corporation that wants to put green panel, solar, whatever, uh, on it because the land is worth a lot. There's a lot of minerals and things on this land. So it has nothing to do with intimate domain. It has to do with wealth, money, power, and all of that. And as soon as that was found out, the federal backed off. And they just said, okay, you keep it. And so now it's calmed down a lot because we now know the, the real thing that's going on there. This is the day and age that we're living in. And these are signs of what's going to happen during the tribulation period. But yet Jesus will come personally and he will deliver Jerusalem. And they will know him because when he comes back, Zechariah chapter 12, 10 through 14 talks about the prince of nails in his hands. He talks about the nail prints in his hands before it even happened. You know Jesus is going to have the nail prints in his hands, the scars in his head, the wound in his side and his feet for eternity. So even when all of this is done and we're in eternity with God, we will look at Jesus and we will see the nail prints as a reminder of what he has done for us. He doesn't want us to forget that. That's why we have communion. That's why we have these holidays celebrating the, the death and crucifixion and resurrection of our Savior to remember what he's done for us because we forget so fast. We forget so fast. So many forget. Right after Easter, usually churches pack out. As soon as Easter's done, we forget. We're not in church anymore. And so we wait till next year, and this brings us back. You know, we look and reflect at our life. Boy, I need to get back to church. I need to get back to basics. I need to just, you know, really just get back to God. And, and we wholeheartedly want it, but then the next day we forget. And it's not here. It's not in our hearts. Oh, it's here, and it's always here, and we know he's there, but we're missing it here in the heart, and we forget. But he's coming back, and we're going to see those stains upon his body. And then this will be the beginning of Armageddon, when Christ will battle against the nations of this world, and guess where he will come? The Mount of Olives. He will come to the Mount of Olives. That will be the place that he touches down, the same place that he ascended unto heaven. And the angel said he's going to come back in the same place. And when he comes to that place, the Bible says a great earthquake will happen and the earth will be moved and God will enter into those golden gates. That is the description of his second coming to this earth of Revelation chapter 19. When he rides in on a horse. Let me read to you Revelation chapter 19 verse 11. It says, Now I saw in heaven, this is John's vision, that he saw in heaven. He says, I saw in heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his 
head were many crowns. He had, ma- he had a name written that no one knew except him. He was clothed with a robe dripped in blood. Again, the picture is he's coming back on a horse to judge the world. In judgment, not in peace. And so he's bathed in this blood and his name is called the Word of God. Where do we see that? John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was God. The Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Who are these armies who are clothed in white and following him on horses? That's us. We're going to be following right behind him. He's going to be that general in the white horse and his appearance and glow will be the pride of all and the glory of all and we will be right behind him as he goes. Now, we won't battle. We won't fight. Because it just says here that out of his mouth will be a flame. He's just going to... It's done. We're going to watch and be witnesses of it all. And it says in verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. You can't say it any other way. The fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. He's representing his Father. And the wrath on mankind because of their rejection of his Son, Jesus Christ. And he has on his robe and on the thigh, so on his thigh is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And he will enter into Jerusalem on that white horse through those gates. It will be a glorious time that we will witness personally as he conquers and rules and reigns. They say that when that happens, that there will be a new waterway. Jerusalem will split and there will be a waterway right down there, that it will be a land flowing with milk and honey. There will finally be peace and rest. Uh, The the lion will lay with the lamb, the serpent with the boy, and there will be uh, finally peace upon the earth for mankind, both Jews and Gentiles, and no more wars or battles will take place. So here's Jesus riding into Jerusalem with peace. And so we have the prophetic declaration in verses 9 through 10. Those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We sang that song earlier. We sang that song earlier. And the people proclaimed it as Jesus rode in on a donkey. And they walked behind the Hallel song. Let me conclude. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He has a heart for lost souls. He has a heart for people. He wants to bring peace to an unpeaceful world. There is so much unrest here. Even here today, I know that you're seeking peace. I I need peace in my home. I need peace in my heart. I need peace with my relationships. I just need peace. I want God to give me peace. Everyone is seeking peace. But God wants to give us peace with God. And we need to start there. We need to have peace with God first. Are you at peace with God? Do you think God's after you? Do you think God's trying to chastise you or judge you? Then there's no peace in your life. You need to know that God loves you. If he is chastising you, he's trying to draw you back into that relationship that he wants with you. And that's where the peace comes. You see, the peace comes knowing that I am right with God because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And so I have peace that if I die, I go to heaven. Now there's nothing here on this earth that will hold me from that. And I have rest and peace in that. Then God gives us other peace. He gives us peace with ourselves. You know, We need that peace in ourselves. Some of us don't have peace with ourselves. We battle with ourselves constantly. You're no good. You'll never measure up. You're not worthy. Who do you think you are? Or you may think you're everything and everyone doesn't know what they're doing and know what, how to do it and you're the answer to all that. And that's not peace. You're constantly in battle. And God wants to bring us peace personally in our own lives that we can rest and trust in Him. Just believe in, in what He has shown us in His Word. And then the other peace that comes along with all of that, peace in our relationships as we grow and we're set apart and His sovereign will and our will are working together for that peace. And so he came to seek and save the lost and to give us peace. He enters into Jerusalem on a donkey, not a threat. Today he's not a threat. Today he's reaching out, saying, come to me, 
All you who labor, who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's what he wants to do. But know this, he's coming back one day, the second coming. And when that happens, he'll be riding a horse. And there is no turning back. There's no, oh, please, now forgive me. No, it's too late. Now's the time to ask for forgiveness. Now's the time to give your life to him. And because of the way things look in our world today, the red, the blood moon taking place to this coming 15th, when earth, the moon, I believe Mercury are completely lined up in line. And this coming 15th is not overcast at night. You will see that moon and it will be red. And it only happens, it's happened three times in the past 500 years. And it will be happening the 15th and then October. And then next year, Passover and the tabernacles. All on Jewish holidays. And things have happened with Israel every time this moon appears. Now it's happened before and these events have taken place. Eclipse have happened before and nothing has happened. No blood, no blood moons, just eclipse and they happen all the time and they're so many every so many days and so forth. But these are different. Something about them. Now I'm not saying that the world's coming to an end and the new beginning's starting. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's interesting how we have these signs in heaven. We have this unrest in the world and Jesus said they're going to be saying peace peace but there is no peace you know, in the end times we have this hatred towards God and religion we have this love for self today more than ever before and these are all signs that God is coming back soon and so we need to be ready I encourage you I, I hope if you're visiting that, that this will be the beginning you know, of a relationship with Christ and getting involved in what he's doing in a work. And I know that some of you might be visiting and might be the first time or second or third time and you're still not sure yet. And that's, that's fine. You find the place where God is leading you to, but you find a place and you go there and you begin to fulfill the plan that God has for your life. Wherever that is, we want you there because it's not about our church. It's about the church church of God and every one of us fulfilling God's plan in our life and so I hope this will be that day that it won't be of the beginning of okay here comes Easter it's religious I know in my head but it never got here and I hope that um, this week as Passion Week continues that we reflect upon our relationship with Christ